So we've got the folks from uh, Tachyonic, the Tachyonic team. It's Alan, Christian, and Dave. It's going to be talking to us about their project, Tachyonic. And uh, as uh, all good stories start, it starts with Meet Bob. So uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. There we go. Not used to this. Can you guys hear me? I'm Christian Rodeman. I work for Exxon Systems. Um, we've been recently doing a lot of development and propriety code for NAV automation. Um, recently, we started an open source project. Uh, it's not completely related to Exxon, but Exxon is sponsoring it and Wingu. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a character, namely Bob. He's your typical network engineer. He's been working with IPX up to MP, BGP, MPLS, and even segment routing. Um, so obviously, he's been around. Bob's universe. Bob's world's changing. Networks are not what they used to be. More operational tasks and services to provision, manage and monitor. Things just don't scale as well. We also need to learn about cloud networks. Managed services just don't make sense for services providers to use physical TIN for files and DPI. Hence, Bob now needs to virtualize these in the cloud and engineer traffic to route over them. This is known as NAV today, network functions virtualized. Customers also want to be able to manage these virt virtual services themselves and deploy them. As a network engineer looking after rapidly growing networks, Bob needs to become a superhero. He wants his entire network to appear to him as a confederated database. Software-defined networking is one concept that attempts to solve this. With software-defined networking, open standards such as OpenFlow have been introduced to attempt to overcome this issue, but interoper interoperability is not quite there yet. One of the problems with OpenFlow is you cannot configure anything on the device. This is only merely controlling the flows on the network. Some of the network vendors that you can see here, Arista, Cumulus, Cisco, Alcatel, Juniper, all of them, they've built their own APIs, but none of these APIs are, have anything in common. Not even the netconf, not everyone's compliant with openconfig either, which is a RFC standard and supported by ITF. So, the DevOps world is much further along at solving these automation orchestration issues. The networking vendor world is still lagging behind. But what are routes is more than just simple computers that you need to manage for a specific task. So there's still no uniform way to control networks in a multi-vendor environment, and there is no off-the-shelf product solution yet that fits every need. But at least we know we have the building blocks to start with network automation. So we have NCC Client, which is a, basically a Python project that's used to control devices via NetConf, such as Juniper, Cisco, and so forth, Alcatel, anything that supports NetConf. But it gets consumed as well uh, by PyEasy and Napalm, which, which basically consumes PyEasy. Napalm allows you to manage multiple devices, PyEasy is focused by Juniper on only their devices, i.e. SRXs or MXs, typical routers and switches. So Bob has options. Um, now, we all, now all he has to do is write some code. Some of the libraries are already available for us, as in NCC Client, a Python library that you can use to utilize NetConf, as we said earlier. Sorry, something's wrong with the presentation, so I'm moving, is it moving on that screen? There you go. Okay, cool. So your screen's stuck. <laughs> uh, so Bob basically needs to learn to develop Python, HTML, WHR frameworks, NetConf, NCC client once again. He can use Napalm, all of these things. REST API with JSON XML. But this still doesn't leave him with any ability to automate anything. He still needs a complete end-to-end -end framework to do it in. So one problem leads to another. Bob can write scripts to automate things, but only he and one of the two of colleagues can use it. After all, with automation, you can use or enable your network to do awesome things. Anyone knows? Build customer portals to provision services in addition to integrated help desk and payment gateways. Build billing and telemetry services on top of Python using well-known open source projects such as Pandas for time series data. However, working in the industry, we've encountered a few Bobs facing these difficulties. In order to answer all the needs, we've started building our own scalable WSGI framework, focused on purely on providing extendable functionality with high-level abstraction interfaces. This is a fairly new undertaking, 
and uh, I'm going to ask Dave to give you a little review of what we've done. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. So, uh, I'm Dave, also from Exxon, an um, engineer there, been in the networking industry for 20 odd years, um, mostly in service provider environments. Uh, lately, have been focusing on network automation and orchestration. So yeah, now you've met Bob and you've seen that he has some tools available, but you've seen that he's not a developer. So, the, so Tachyonic is our answer to Bob's problems. So what is Tachyonic? Can everybody hear me fine? All right, cool. Um, it's an open source framework. So not only does it floor the competition with, in regards with costs, but you can see the code, and more importantly, you can change the code if you want to. It was dum 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 written in Python. So I'm pretty sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but as Chris mentioned, you've seen that there are many libraries and tools available today, and in the networking space and Bob's universe, Python is the language of choice. So this is why we also used Python to build Tachyonic, because all of those libraries and things that's already out there that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you can just throw into the Tachyonic framework, which is actually basically more of a, uh, what do you call it, than a framework, a ecosystem. ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it basically has two components, a web user interface and a REST API. In fact, the web user interface simply uses the API in the back end. So basically, everything that you can do in the web user interface, you can also do through the API, which is important because now we can orchestrate and hook into existing OSS operational systems and BSS business systems. All right, so what do you get when you install Tachyonic? You get a system out of the box that is multi-tiered and multi-tenant, meaning ISPs can use it for themselves to provide services to their customers, but they also can be a wholesale provider to reseller customers who can then offer it to their customers, and so on and so on. You also get domains, which is basically just a logical separation between resources, for example, um, uh, tenants or roles or whatever, so when you're in one domain, you're locked into that domain and can't access things in other domains. Uh, what you also, also get is role-based access control. So what you do is you create roles and then specify which role can access which resource. We also designed it to be fully customizable, really. If you don't like the way that it looks and feels, just change the CSS. Uh, if you don't like the layout, simply override the HTML Jinja template that generates it. And Tachyonic was designed to be completely modular and extensible. So adding your own functionality is as easy as writing a bit of Python code and adding it as a module into the Tachyonic um, settings file. And then finally, it was designed to be flexible. Do you like Apache or Nginx? It's a WSGI framework, you choose. You want to make it more redundant or highly available? Use HAProxy, it scales horizontally and vertically. You want it more secure? Uh, simply install the API on a system behind a firewall and the web UI portion on a system in the DMZ because they don't have to run on the same machine because the web UI simply makes calls to the API. Okay, so the Tachyonic system basically comprises of a couple of projects. First of all, we have Tachyonic Neutrino, which is the WSGI framework that all the other, or, or the web UI and the REST API actually uses to provide um, the, the web calls. Then obviously there's the Tachyonic API portion of the system, and then the Tachyonic UI portion of the system, which, make, which makes use of the API, as I've mentioned. And then there's also a project on our GitHub um, projects called Tachyonic Common, which is simply the, the project that 
has all the libraries and files and things that are common to all of the rest of them. And then finally, there's also the Tachyonic client, which is a REST client that you can use, or even the UI uses, to make the calls to the API. Okay, now just a little bit of Python code to show you how easy it is to add something or a resource to Tachyonic. First of all, you import some stuff. Then obviously from Tachyonic Neutrino, you'll import the app and then use that, to the app resources method to decorate you any class you want to use, and then when you initialize it, simply m add to the app router the URI path that is applicable to it, the HTTP verb for that path, and which method it has to use to process that request. So in this case, we have a HTTP GET, both HTTP GET and POST, um, listening on IPCALC URI, both using the IPCALC method, and here at the bottom you can see the IPCALC method, you simply do some stuff, set some variables, grab, th grab some values out of the request post, and then we fire up our uh, Jinja, and you parse a Jinja template, and then simply respond in the body with a template rendered with the variables applicable values. It's as simple as that. So, when you install it, this is what the default web interface looks like. Pretty simple layout. At the top we have the menu, with by default only two menu items, accounts and system. Accounts has th uh, is where you would add users, roles, domains, and tenants. System is simply just a, an entry where you can change the CSS um, of the specific uh, site. So what happens is you can install it on, on a web server and then based on the FQDN that accessed, um, that was accessed in the browser, change the look and feel. So you can, this is once again one of those things where multiple people can use it and it's the same system, but depending on the FQDN that you access, it looks and feels different. Then at the top right is where you select your tenant. So once you've selected a tenant there at the top right, everything you do from that point onward is only applicable to that tenant. Um, at the top left, it will show you what the currently selected tenant is. So everything you do from that point only happens on that tenant. And by the way, this is the, as we've mentioned many times before, this is the web UI, but everything you do here can also happen via the API, so it can be done programmatically. So if you click on accounts, users, view the users, let's see what it looks like when you view the root user. So at the top, you can see this is the root user. Oh, I can walk around. Uh, I don't have a laser pointer. All right, so root user has the, oh sorry, the root user has the root role on the default domain for all the tenants. So let's quickly look at a, one of the config files, our policy.json file. So here you can see that role that I was showing you on the previous slide and talking about the role-based access control. These roles show up here and they tie to rules. And then these rules you can use in a Boolean fashion to specify these policies. And then those policies dictate and govern and control which user and role can access which resource on the system. So let's look at a quick example. Once again, here we decorate our class with the app resources. And then here where we add a URI to a, to a root as the last um, argument to this method, we simply specify the policy that is applicable to that resource. So if a user is logged in and he's not on the roles view policy, then sorry, he cannot access that resource. resource. Oh, and by the way, at the top there, that's how easy it is to add an entry to the menu. You simply go add to the admin menu, under the accounts, add a entry called roles, That'll point to that URI forward slash roles, which is protected by that policy. So if a user is logged in and he doesn't belong to that policy, he doesn't even have that menu item. All right, so let's look at a quick use case of what we can do with Tachyonic. Netrino is a network orchestrator named after Neutrino on which it was built, the WSGI framework. So um, this is a 
example of a tachyonic module that was just plugged into the system. It acts as the middleware between your network and your OSS BSS. So your business systems, bus <laughs> business systems can make API calls to the system. Users can access it via HTTP, and then it uses whatever it needs to to speak to the network. So yeah, basically it's a network orchestration tool. So it retrieves information from the network, things like devices, ports, IP addresses, MAC addresses, whatever, and it pushes things to the network as well, either triggered via the web UI or, the, or an API call. And then yes, we use the Jinja 2 templating engine to make what we call services. So what that basically is, is just a little bit of configuration template that you want to put on the device, parsed by a, a Jinja template. And then the whole point of Netrino is to create a service request. So a service request involves associating three things to each other. First is the tenant, secondly the service, and lastly the device and or device port that this thing must work on. So if you create, click on, okay, first of all, in the default tachyonic screen, you select the tenant for which this service request is applicable, then click service request, the second thing is the service there at the top, and then lastly, the third thing is the device. And then if this specific service had some variables in the Jinja template, those will appear here as required fields in the form. Then simply hit create, and off it goes in the background, tell Celery to invoke Napalm, to go and do whatever it needs to do on the network, push that uh, piece of config to the device, with the variables that was entered here. Oh yeah, and then um, we also have built some intelligence to say, hey, only make available in the drop-down box the interfaces that is available and is applicable to this specific service. In any case, just, just, that's just one um, use case that we've used so far. So now I'm gonna call my colleague, Alan, to come and talk about other use cases just that we thought of at the top of our head that this can be used for possibly and also what we're currently doing and the future for Tachyonic. Thanks, Alan. Hey, I'm Alan. Um, I'm a software developer by trade, hopefully, by now. Um, I've been doing software development for roughly really 15 years, um, and I don't work for Exxon. Sorry, guys, not yet. Um, sorry, just how are we looking on time? Okay, cool. Um, so we've all now heard what the network guys have done with us in their scope of work and in their fields. But how could other organizations use this? We said in the beginning, this is versatile. So, as a, any organization or large ISP, you may want to use a single interface to manage email accounts, SIP accounts, VPN accounts, user credentials and access management in the single pane of glass. At at least eight out of the 10 companies that I've been with in my career up until now, one of the most fearsome tasks that most people have to deal with is onboarding and offboarding of users within their organization. Does this guy have VPN access, yes or no? Okay, now log a ticket to the guys dealing with the VPN component to go and deprovision this user off the VPN. This is one manual task. Oh, log another call to the guys dealing with the exchange to close this guy's mailbox or forward all his mails to, so to the manager or whatever the process of that company is. These are mundane tasks. What the framework that we've built helps us do is you simply go and you disable the user and all of these can be cascaded into anything that's applied to that user, whether it be an email account, whether it be a SIP account, whether it be a VPN account. <coughs> Further than that, we all want monitoring. All our managers want monitoring. All of them want reports. Um, I've specifically separated the words networking, infrastructure, and services because depending on what area you're in, those are three different classes of entities that want three different forms of reports um, and monitoring. Uh, with the reporting, again, how do you define your reporting? How do you want to customize your reporting? 
um, in, the, in the service provider world, what's your, what's your definition of MTTR? Is it mean time to resolution or is it mean time to response? Those things differ between companies. How you measure your SLA, how you track your progress through these things differ across any organization anywhere in the world. But our framework allows you to customize these things and still provide it to you in a single pane of glass. Help desk, incident reporting. Do you have to now interact with a separate system to get your tickets? Not anymore. The possibilities are endless. Some of our current projects. Wingu, uh, OpenStack Public IIS uh, Infrastructure as a Service Provider, has contributed open source OpenStack connectors that plug into Tachyonic. For those of you that were yesterday and watched the Wingo talk, what they're doing with, along with Tachyonic in their environment is very amazing. Um, Wingo is also going to uh, work with us to release some Cloud Kitty integration again back into our framework. And there's a lot more in the pipeline, including network automation, writ uh, network automation uh, code written specifically for Exxon. Um, and by the names there, um, these are fairly large companies that's using and contributing back to um, our open source project already. Um, so what's on the roadmap for, for Tachyonic? Well, firstly, as Krista mentioned, is our code base is still very young. We need to evolve and mature our code base and most definitely work on our documentation. Um, to be added are billing and help desk components that are already completely integrated out of the box. There are several basic modules, but fundamental specifically for service management that we are also working on. Um, we are also working on major networking modules, including BGP, SDN controllers, and NFV. One of our highest priorities right now is globalizing our resource manager. So in the demo that Dave did, the same resource manager will be used for allocating IPs, allocating VLAN IDs, uh, creating the interfaces as a single globalized component so that any other component that you have could interact with your resource manager. So, in summary, we have already done all the hard work and now Bob only needs to focus on his Python which he can plug into our framework. In conclusion, we hope to find some interesting parties today that could benefit from what we've built or would like to join us in building something that every other Bob out there can use to become a, super, a superhero in their world. How can you find us? Um, you can find us on the web, tachyonic.coza, um, on ZA Tech Slack channel. Uh, I've created hashtag um, I'll probably be lurking there from Monday. I'm also in hash Python there. Um, so just ask around, people will point you in my direction. Uh, I'm Dragon Master on Slack for anyone that's there. Um, and you can also find us on GitHub or just send us an email. Lastly, thank you. Um, Wingu, thank you for the contributions to our project, as well as the sponsorship that allowed us the opportunity to be here today to present. To PyCon and the organizers, thank you for having us. And lastly, to all of you, thank you for coming to listen. Okay, so we have uh, lots of time for questions. Um, I, have a I have a question. So your logo is a snail moving really, really quickly. Is that correct? Okay. At the, at the speed of light. <laughs> okay. So we have two questions. Hi, Alan. Thanks for your talk. Um, given the naming of the project, can I use this to solve network problems that I've had in the past? Well... <laughs> What are your network problems to start with? So, so wh what? Well, la just last year we had a network outage, and I'd like to go back and fix that. <laughs> um, light moves forward. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't go back in time to fix stuff, but but we could 
we, we could help you um, with this project, make your network more visible so that cascading failures are more visible to you and your team. So that problems like a large outage are less likely to occur. 90% of large outages that I've dealt with are missed due to visibility. And trust me, I've been, I was at Amazon for three years. So when you have these large outages at the point where the customer impacting, it's because someone missed something or didn't watch something or didn't monitor something properly. And that trend of an, a creeping outage or an initial failure that cascaded into something else is so long before it gets noticed you have about a lot of triggers that need to be hit before you hit the point where, where your network now becomes visibly damaged. Okay, thank you. And um, monitoring, I mean, can I plug this into my existing um, Grafana um, databases where I monitor my metrics or? Um, not, not right now, it is possible. So um, we're actually, um, using because we haven't integrated so uh, completely with Grafana specifically, um, we're more using uh, time series data, so something like pandas. For our other graphing, we're using uh, JQ, and um, I think Dave would probably be better to answer that specific question. Yeah, I, the the real answer is yes, because all you need to do is write your piece of Python that points to you Grafana. Is it off now? Oh, okay. And then yes, the answer is. We made it extensible, so you can plug in there whatever you want. F um, we've st we started using JQplot um, for our graphing, but it's not, you know, for one of our projects. But it's not to say that you have to do the same. I mean, you can plug in whatever you want. Hey, thanks. Um, I work also for a large uh, service integrator, and uh, we, we actually started a, a um, learn to code in Python for the last three months where everybody in my team learned Python to build dashboards, things like that. And uh, one of the core needs we need, especially as a service integrator to a lot of other clients, is we want to sort of have a dashboard, you know, that, that, like you say, give us enough forewarning when we see things going wrong at our customer sites so that we can be a bit more preemptive in in that this looks like something that could potentially help with that, but I is there some place where I could have a look at a demo or something like that? You know, uh, s see what kind of options there are? Yeah, we're actually working on that. Um, on our to-do list, we want a live demo um, running. So, but at the moment, what you'll see is what I showed on the, the default web page. You can add users, roles, domains, and change the way it looks, and that's it. So at this point, now that you know a little bit of Python, I mean, you could have used this to save you a lot of time. That's why it's called Tachyonic. It allows you to do rapid web and, and API development. So you don't have to, to worry about key value stores and message buses and all of these things. Th it's there already for you to use. Fire it up and just plug in the, the pieces that you need. That or they're all asleep. <laughs>